So the possibility of migration offers millions of people the opportunity to improve their lives and rebuild relationships with their families. In addition, many nations depend on immigration to develop their economies and labor forces. And to help you understand, this chapter discusses the issue of global migration flows, which is still one of the most divisive aspects of modern globalization. We will discuss the migrants, migration, illegal immigration, remittances, and diaspora as we progress through this video. So, be on board. Nowadays, there is a lot of population mobility due to the globalization. And migration is a major contributor of this movement. While migration can take place within a single nation, this chapter we will concentrate on the international migrants, which are somebody who was not born but has developed strong ties, social ties to the country they now live in, whether temporarily or permanently. A common example that I can give is the foreigner we see here in the Philippines who opted to reside and develop strong ties in our culture and society. Or maybe an overseas Filipino worker who was in a certain country for a long period of time. So as of 2017, the United Nations reported about 258 million international migrants or about 3.4% of our population. Despite these huge numbers and widespread media coverage, migration rates for employment-related reasons fall behind those for the reasons such as mobility of commodities, services, and technology. So numerous regions and nations do have sizable proportion of their population made up of migrants. And according to the United Nations statistic from 2017, the largest regions attracting new international migrants are Europe with 80 million and Asia with 78 million. However, the United States continues to have larger, um, the largest popula migrant population in 2017. There were 49.8 million residents who were foreign born. Furthermore, the main international migratory route runs throughout the U.S.-Mexico border region. On the other hand, the Philippines' net migration rate in 2021 is 0 0.609 by 1,000 people. So moving forward, the characteristics of today's migrant have undergone some exciting and significant modifications. Compared to the rest of the world's population, they have a higher likelihood of being of working age. This rise in the working age population contributes to a decline in the dependence ratio with smaller numbers of children and the elderly. So, international migration alone is driving population expansion in several high-income countries. If it were not for international migration, the population of Europe would have decreased between the years of 2000 and 2015. People are limited in the potential to discuss migration since it is exceedingly challenging to monitor some population flows. First is that there are several nations that do not gather such information. These are the data and the statistics about the migrants and the time that they are staying in a certain country. Second is that the majority of those who do frequently fail to report them to international organizations. Third is that different nations define population flows differently. As to the um, stability of movement and the length of residency needed to qualify as migrants. Fourth is that few nations maintain records of their immigrants. And lastly, monitoring unauthorized immigrants presents enormous challenges. So these constraints affect how we view migrants. Hence, one must bear this limitation in mind when talking about migration. Good day po, I am Rini Rusti Alvaro and I will discuss migration. This discussion will focus on international migration, international migration, 
refers to the movement of people from one country to either live temporarily or permanently to another country. So why is there migration? There is migration due to various reasons. It can be economic or social. So to list a few, here are some factors that contribute to migration. Some of them are the push and pull factors. So yung push factors are the factors that push people away from their original country. Example nito ay war and unemployment. So and on the other hand, uh, yung pull factors ay factors na tumutulak or nag encourage sa tao na lumipat sa ibang bansa. Example nito is higher pay and better employment. However, uh, migration is not without effects. Para dun sa bansa na pinanggalingan, pwede nito maapektuhan yung ability ng bansa to compete globally kasi uh, yung tao is isang resources. Para naman sa bansa na paglilipatan niya, pwede mag-prosper economically kasi gaya nga nasabi ko, uh, tao is resources, madadagdagan sila ng human resources. Another effects are it can lead to conflicts and concerns over terrorism. Unlike trade, finance, and investment, there are various restrictions on the migration of people. With that said, there have been an increase in unauthorized immigration, so we will discuss unauthorized immigration later. Over the years, there have been a selective reduction in barriers to migration in many countries. So included dito ay due to labor shortages, aging populations, and new tax revenues offered by migrants, Kasi these migrants are usually of working age, and since they are of working age, they can contribute to society through labor and taxes. So, special kinds of international migrants are refugees and asylum seekers. For this part, we will discuss the flow of migrants, particularly the Mexicans, to and from the United States. For this discussion, like what we have said earlier, we will discuss the undocumented or unauthorized migrant. So this means that these migrants may have crossed the border without authorization, hence not through legal means, or they may have remained in the U.S. after their visas expired. So in 2018, approximately 11.3 million immigrants reside in the U.S. without authorization. And of that, um, 5.6 million were Mexicans. So there are various reasons as to why Mexicans migrate to U.S. This includes more job and better job opportunities and mas mataas na mas na sweldo sa U.S. kaysa sa Mexico. So how can we know if uh, a migrant is undocumented or unauthorized? So here are indicators of legitimacy. This include insurance cards, credit cards, social security cards, and green cards. Here are some problems encountered by undocumented Mexican immigrants. So they are often discriminated and they have limited access. So, to continue our discussion, let us proceed to the program of the U.S. government. So, to help children whose parents have brought them to the United States without authorization, the U.S. government, during the presidency of former U.S. President Obama, uh, they implemented the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival Arrivals, or DACA. The the intention of this program was to enable those who were brought to the United States as, as children to pursue schooling or employment. So here are the qualifications. Unfortunately, during the next administration, the administration of former President Donald Trump, the ACA was announced to an end. So to further continue our discussion, let us proceed to the increased law enforcement. So during the term of President Donald Trump, he implemented strategies to secure the borders. This include expanded border patrols, increased deportation efforts, and the border wall between the United States and Mexico. However, 
uh, these strategies are criticized due to their high due to their high costs and undocumented evidence proving na effective talaga sila at sa pagprevent at pagdiscourage ng unauthorized migration. Flow of immigrants into and within Europe. The Maastricht Treaty paved the way for the establishment of the European Union. Since its ratification, less developed Eastern European nations and a couple of nations have been added to the Union. One of the objectives of the European Union was to open its borders to immigrants as far as the member nations and their citizens are concerned. However, the flow of immigrants, whether authorized or unauthorized, has led to major concerns in a couple of countries. And with that, these countries call for reassertion of border controls. With the admission of new members to the Union, Great Britain has spotted an inflow of over half a million people. These immigrants took low-paying jobs. They are a threat to British workers because the job they obtained has an overall impact for lowering the wages for all. There are other arguments about this issue. For example, the low-wage immigrants in the Great Britain helps aid the country by making their products less expensive. Therefore, their products gain an advantage in the marketplace. These immigrants also take jobs that the natives reject, either because of low wages or the nature of the work. Their wages are seen to help reduce the tendency of inflation and the taxes they pay help fund the public services. However, despite the number of advantages, fears of immigration has led the British public to vote to leave the European Union. Migration into Britain was previously increasing but fell by half in the year following the Brexit vote. By this, British companies found it hard to look for skilled labor specifically, leaving the positions vacant. Despite of this, a large number of undocumented migrants still make it into Europe. There are some evidence seen that there is a decline of undocumented immigrants in Europe, but the question is, will it continue in the long term? In a conclusion, these barriers can keep out those who desperately want to move in. Flow of Migrants in Asia The problem of undocumented immigrants does not only happen in Europe and United States. It is also a problem in Asian countries. As an example, there are 4 million immigrants in Malaysia. About 2 million of them are unauthorized. About 15% of the skilled labor in Malaysia are immigrants. They mostly came from poor neighboring countries. The Malaysian government tasked Tarela, an armed people's volunteer corps, who are permitted to stop a suspect on the street, even enter their home. The numbers of Rela members have increased. It is even larger than the Malaysian police. However, Various abuses such as violence, extortion, theft, and illegal detention was reported by a human rights group. The undocumented immigrants feared them. The issue of often undocumented immigrants also take place in Central Asia. Large numbers of people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan has moved into Russia. In fact, all of them are currently working, some seasonally, either with or without authorization, despite of being treated very badly by making them slaves or even selling them into the market, migrants keep on coming because economic conditions are so pulled back on their home. Let's now move on to the case against the backlash to undocumented or illegal immigration. The various obstacles that are being put in the ways of immigrants have drawn heavy criticisms from a number of groups. According to a lot of individuals, immigration, whether legal or illegal, is more advantageous to the host nation because it brings in young, energetic, and ambitious new workers of all sorts. 
Although immigrants have benefited greatly, there has also been some backlash. One of this is that politicians were garnering a lot of popularity and support by bringing illegal immigration and foreigners into the public spotlight because they were an easy target. They were used as a scapegoat, held responsible for the crimes they didn't commit, or even framed. They were treated as dangerous felons. Many locals find them troubling, especially when they interact with them frequently because of differing nature. Additionally, the competition posed by undocumented immigrants threatens the least skilled native workforce. However, few people in the public support undocumented immigrants in spite of these prejudices. One of them is Jonathan Moses, who asserted that immigration has benefited the economy rather than hurt it. Contrary to popular belief, immigration increased workers' overall standard of living by increasing wages and cutting prices. Moreover, immigrants do not deplete the government's resources and may even contribute more to taxes than they consume in services. Another factor is the rising demand for an infusion of youthful, energetic, and hungry workers in developed countries since these countries were dominated by an aging labor force. Overall, if border controls were loosened, migration became more unrestricted and communities learned to value a diversified population with lively cultures, this may be a big opportunity to everyone. Okay, so as more and more immigrants, both authorized and unauthorized, entered developed countries for the search of employment, the remittances is becoming more and more significant. According to Kunz 2018, who, those who are successful tend to end up giving back to their community or the country of origin for the support and maintenance of their family. And also, remittances are the second big source of international financial transfer to developing nations. These are typically viewed as benefit for person who receives them as well as um, the economies of communities in which they reside. And also, recipients are better equipped to deal with poverty and natural calamities and purchase the necessities and afford a few luxuries such as television and cell phone. So, generally speaking, remittances can first reduce poverty rates. Second is that funds go immediately to the individuals in need and teach them about banking and saving. Third is that it assists handling emergencies such as the money goes to satisfy the important needs for food, housing, allowances, education, and health. And fourth, it can be utilized to increase educational standards. And tip, it can be a source of pride and assurance for the recipient community. And lastly, um, remittances can boost a country's foreign reserves and consequently lower its debt level. But on the other hand, there are also disadvantages of remittances. And first is that due to the higher wage, the most educated and skilled citizen in less developed um, nations are those who are most likely to live or stay in developed nations. And as a result, the economy of the home country suffers. Second is that economic growth and development do not always follow financial infusions into local economies. It means remittances enabled increases in personal consumption don't translate um, into more spending on the economic infrastructure that supports economic growth. Third is that um, local gangs may target people who receive remittances in an effort to steal either the money or the goods they buy with it. So, napaka talamak nito sa ating country wherein uso yung hold up in Fourth is that the funds occasionally go to the nations with 
uncertain regimes such as North Korea and Zimbabwe. So this is based from the material that is given to us. Okay, so when people immigrate in pursuit of work, um, the research states that there is an issue with those left behind, such as the children. And according to the UNICEF official, behind every um, remittance, there is a separated family. So, ito yung um, lagi din nating na-encounter na reality, especially sa mga families na may OFW. And then, the sixth that the majority of remittances do not go to the poorest countries. In reality, middle-income nations are those that receive the greatest aid. Okay, so, in the end, it really only amounts to little quantities of money. And the discussion of remittances sometimes ob obscure the issue of migrant um, workers being exploited. Overall, remittances have become a more common occurrence, although they may not necessarily be a great benefit to the population and economies of developing nations. However, many people's lives have improved substantially due to their remittances. And according to a pioneer in the field of remittances, it is, he said that let's not forget a billion dollars in the hands of poor people is a lot of money. Next is diaspora. Although there is no doubt that diasporas and globalization are related, the more one considers the relationship, the more complex it becomes. To begin with, it is obvious that some diasporas predate globalization in anything like its popularly accepted definition. Regardless of how globalization is temporarily denoted, something that has recurred during the modern period or has only occurred over the previous 30 to 40 years. As the world become more globalized, the use of the term diaspora has expanded. It was commonly used back then to denote a number of different population movements. However, the term's usage has grown in recent years to include any population dispersion and dislocation. The phrase has become so widely and indiscriminately used that many claim there is no longer consensus on what it means in diaspora discourse, that it has become less clear, and that it is in danger of being little more than a buzzword. But there have been countless attempts to outline a perfect or typical diaspora. The way Paul Gilroy views the diaspora as a transnational process that engages in conversation with both imagined and actual locations is very noteworthy. Here, the idea of diaspora as a process, more precisely a global process, is implied. Today, however, there are not only more diasporas, but also more people who use this phrase to refer to themselves and their interpersonal connections. As the world becomes more globalized, it's getting more and harder to tell the difference between diasporic migrations and many other types of transnational migrations and movements.